I, I would like to start by conceptualizing a potential voter and to ask, what is on the mind of that individual as the individual decides whether to vote, because that is a first choice, and if to vote, for whom? It is unusual to have that voter exist in Jim Fishkin's deliberative space, where all of the available arguments are there, presented in as best one can a neutral fashion, in a climate in which deliberation is privileged and logos is central to the ethos. Instead, that individual is influenced by everything in that individual's environment. And all of those influences are moving to make some things more salient and others less salient. And in the process, the capacity to affect whether that person votes and how that person votes is subject to a climate of information in an environment that can be controlled if one can move that individual into an enclave, also called a filter bubble, a community of the like-minded in which one largely controls the amount and kinds of information to which the person is exposed. And so in the model I want to offer you today, the Russians come into this environment and do not so much introduce new information as change the balance of information and the kind of information, as well as the direction of information, to advantage Donald Trump and disadvantage Hillary Clinton. And they do so in order to mobilize some and demobilize others while shifting the votes of a remainder. And that is my theory of how they attempted to influence the election. It is in that context that I ask the question, what is this? And what is this? Let's talk a little bit about why the media blackout and the silence from Washington on the Seth Rich case should scare the hell out of you. You have a DNC staffer shot dead in the streets of Washington. Not only that, you have a mountain of evidence suggesting that he is the WikiLeaks source. And what is this? And the answer is, these are all Russian attempts to increase the likelihood that a target audience will feature some facets of information, not others, and create a perspectival frame for viewing the election in which the Russians are not engaged in hacking, but the hacks are attributable to a DNC staffer who was tragically killed in a botched robbery in DC, and hence, this was an inside job. The Russians should not be part of this discussion. These pieces of information are being driven by the third, which is a social media site set up by the Russians to create the illusion that these are Tennessee Republicans. And in this site, they promote your access to and the likelihood you will see and approve of these other forms of information, many of which were already circulating in a conservative media sphere, but now get increasing access because of this promotion structure. And to the extent that the social media platforms let the Russians aggregate up the like-minded into those enclaves, and then, through the capacities of social media, increase the likelihood that you believe that others like you approve of those messages. They increase the likelihood that you silence the alternative in the community through the spiral of silence theory, one deeply rooted in understanding of how the Greeks theorize democracy and freedom of speech, and in the process, increase the likelihood that what you see as salient is anti-Clinton and pro-Trump, and as a result, that you vote in the intended direction, or if they are creating discrepant cues between your preferred candidate, Hillary Clinton, and your disposition, that you not vote at all. So the vulnerabilities inherent in the social media system and in the structures of the US press are being manipulated by trying to increase your access to inhospitable information about Clinton and positive information to the extent that they did that, and they did that to a minimal extent about Trump. Let's look at the first. The social media platforms let us obscure identity, hence the Russians can hide. They aggregate the like-minded because that's the model by which they monetize us, the audience, to sell us to advertisers. They are capable of agitating in, agitating in unique ways. 
because we tend to move toward emotionally evocative content. We are driven to anger, fear, and prejudice to the extent that they serve them up. We are more likely to share them. They are signaling cues into the system through use of, use of bots, which create automatic and quick signals of like-minded approval to suggest that the community approves. That increases the likelihood of sharing, but also the sense that what you are thinking is mainstream. You are not outside a community of discourse that would disapprove of these signals. Then you get the amplification as you get linking and alerting to also anything else in the media structure that is consistent with that. And you target because the platforms are designed to be able to micro-target and now into enclaves of the like-minded that are amplifying anti-Clinton, pro-Trump content. And they know whom they're trying to aggregate. They're trying to aggregate white working class voters who feel like strangers in their own land, who believe the US needs protecting against foreign influence, and that category of individual is 3.5 times more likely to favor Trump. So all you have to do is find them and then take these tendencies into social media to activate them, and you've got a mobilizing structure. So who do you need to mobilize? Take a look at these patterns from the polls. Those two-thirds of white working class voters who say American culture has gotten worse, now you've got your theme. 68% say the U.S. is in danger of losing its identity, second theme. 62% say a growing number of immigrants threaten the, the country's culture, you've got your theme. More than half say discrimination against whites has become just as problematic as discrimination against minorities, you've got your theme. Now take these tendencies, lock those themes in, you've got your audience, the platforms are designed to deliver the like-minded, you've got your theory of how you're going to affect change, and what you've got is something that looks like this. And remember that this is now occurring, occurring in an environment without counter signals. This is not Jim's world. This is not Teresa's world. This is now a world in which we've created a community of the like-minded. And to the extent that that community has its fears and anxieties being played on, we're increasing the likelihood that we will mobilize or demobilize in the intended direction. What were the targeted communities? In order to be effective, the Russians had to have a theory of the election that was consistent with the electoral needs of Donald Trump. He needed to mobilize evangelicals and veterans. If the percent of evangelicals, and also conservative Catholics, and veterans who said they supported him in August was the percent that turned out to vote for him in November, he not only lost, he lost decisively. But that was not the world that occurred in November, in part because the Trump campaign and its allies and also the Russian intruders worked hard to mobilize these constituencies. Black voters and Sanders supporters needed to be suppressed. And young liberals and voters disaffected with Hillary Clinton needed to be shifted to an alternative candidate if they would not shift to Trump or stay home. And in this case, we have evidence the Russians tried to shift them to Stein. So let's look at the signaling cues. Notice press like. At the point at which you press like, I can now begin to aggregate you into the audience of the like-minded. We know on election eve, there was massive social media targeting to all of those aggregated by all of these previous media streams with appeals to vote. This is to target veterans. Now notice anger, fear, prejudice. More targeting to veterans. Now here's the demobilizing move. Hillary Clinton needs to bring in the voting blocks that supported Barack Obama. If the African American community and the Sanders, suppo Sanders supporters stay home, she is less likely to win the election. If they fall back to historical levels in the black community, she's less likely to win election. And so there's targeting of black voters not to suggest that they vote for Trump, although there are appeals saying he's perfectly fine, don't worry about him, you have nothing to fear, but rather to suggest you just simply should stay home. There's the argument made that because much of the social media activity 
appears to be playing on social division in society, the African-American community against the police community, on the assumption, by the way, that they're not overlapping communities. That, that must have been about roiling discontent in the body politic, not attempting to defeat Hillary Clinton. But ask yourself if the incumbent African-American president and his designated heir apparent are the persons who are standing in as the Democratic Party symbol structure, and what you suggest is all sorts of social discontent across all those areas from which you're leveraging your fear and your prejudice, what is the reasonable thing that you assume a voter is going to do other than vote against them and for the alternative, which is arguing it will establish order? Here's the targeting for Sanders supporters. And of course, he didn't say that. And here's the move to shift to Stein. Choose peace and vote for Jill Stein. The ad reads, trust me, it's not a wasted vote. The only way to take our country back is to stop voting for the corporations and banks that own us. Grow a spine, vote Jill Stein. A search of RT, that's Russia today. But incidentally, when you see it in the, in the signal system, it looks a lot like retweet because RT is retweet in social media. Um, a search of RT and Sputnik archives shows that more than 100 stories, both online and on air, friendly to Stein and the Green Party occurred. What are the vulnerabilities associated in the social media structure? The platforms are essentially designed as a delivery mechanism to turn the like-minded into sharers and likers and they are disposed to do that about appeals to fear, anger, and prejudice in an environment in which that's possible to aggregate them in sufficient numbers that you can appeal to them to mobilize. If you properly target those whom Trump needs to mobilize, you should increase the likelihood that you get that outcome. Second argument, there are vulnerabilities inside our press structure. Now again, remember my theory. What the Russians need to do is increase the salience of anti-Hillary messaging in an environment in which Trump is not a desirable alternative for many of those voters. And so the question in the hacking is, to what extent can they control the media agenda? For more than 40 years, scholars in communication have discussed and studied the effects of media agenda setting. When media focus on a topic, they tell us what to think about. They increase the, the statistical likelihood that we will focus on that topic. When media frame, when they contextualize by inclusion and exclusion, they increase the likelihood that we will think about those things set in the agenda in the way that is consistent with the frame. Frames are ways of seeing. The hacking of the democratic content by the Russians increased the likelihood that the media would put anti-Hillary Clinton content into the agenda, an agenda setting effect, and frame it through traditional media lenses that are simply sitting there waiting for exploitation. And as a result, create an effect across the body politic, not targeted any specific group, but all those specific groups are sitting within the body politic that would reweight the agenda against Hillary Clinton. Here's the structure. Private information was hacked and stolen, then Guccifer 2 and the Russian hackers post it. Sites hosting the data are registered, that's DC links, and then they begin to work through WikiLeaks. Fake personae were created to draw attention to hacked content, that's the social media piece. Social media accounts are created to amplify the news reports of the hacked content. Peer groups and networks then share the hacked content and the news media publicize it. That's how the process worked. There's a synergy as a result between the trolls and the hackers and party three in this social media, and party four are mainstream most respected media outlets, which found the hacked content irresistible. Because the press is drawn to scandal, revelations and suspense, appearance versus reality as a trope, which is a highly simplifying narrative, strategy and tactics, not substance. When the Access Hollywood tape is released on October 7th, on that same day, the US intelligence agencies released the information that the hacking done and being released up to that point in the election, including through the Democratic Convention, was done by Russians. So on October 7th, we have beginning of the day, the Russians did it. Access Hollywood tape then released, it looks like the scandal of the campaign that will take down the Trump 
candidacy, and you'd expect it would dominate news for that weekend. Within an hour, the hacked content from the Podesta emails is released, including excerpts of the Clinton speeches, which she had refused to disclose throughout the primaries, despite insistence by Bernie Sanders that there there were scandals and revelations. You see the press theme building, reinforced by Sanders, that would discredit her candidacy. What happens as a result of the leaks of the, through WikiLeaks, of the Podesta emails is that the news agenda is reset for the morning of the second debate, which is two days later, October 9th. And instead of on the Sunday morning shows, you're seeing the Russians did it, which you would expect to be in the news, would you not? We just have an announcement the Russians are trying to interfere with our elections, and Access Hollywood tape being the second part of the news cycle. Those playing against each other would create an anti-Trump frame and agenda in news. Instead, the Russians did it disappears from the narratives. It's not there anymore, and we have the Access Hollywood tape played against the so-called revelations and scandals, the appearance versus reality of the Clinton speeches. And they are treated in equivalence frame as if one is the equivalent of the others. And because the intelligence community revelations are not being treated at all, they are being described as WikiLeaks content, not Russian hacked or stolen content. And the language is not the language of subversion or subterfuge, but simply leak. And what do reporters like? They like leaks. And they like to uncover things themselves. In fact, one line of argument will argue, if the press had been able to find those speeches, they would have done exactly what WikiLeaks did. The Democrats aren't able to argue there's anything inaccurate in those transcripts. And as a result, the Russian piece of the narrative simply drops. And now we have Access Hollywood being willing to grab women by the, I will not say it in public, against what are the revelations and what did she really say in those speeches. Across time, Access Hollywood fades out of the news narrative and WikiLeaks persists in the news narrative. That's what this slide is showing you. And it does that because the Russian hackers in complicity with Julian Assange and WikiLeaks kept dropping new press revelations in, in the form of new media content. The social media streams kept pushing attention toward those things and the press kept picking those things up. Those things cannot help Hillary Clinton. Here's one of the results. October 7th, I've marked with the blue line. Until you get to October 28th, when the Comey investigation is reopened, which accounts for that last run of red for Hillary Clinton, that change in Hillary Clinton's trend line is directly attributed to press covering of the WikiLeaked Russian stolen content designed to create an influence on the election. Susceptibilities on the part of the press caused a huge dilemma for reporters because this is actual content, not fabricated content. The Democrats never argued that there was an instance of it out there that was being prominently featured in news that was inaccurate. So now there's a dilemma for our reporters. But there's also a disequilibrium being created because there's no comparable hacked content for Trump. Imagine a scenario in which we knew what was in the emails, let's just say of Kellyanne Conway and Donald Trump Jr. during this time as they deliberated about how to handle all of these scandals. But we're not aware of that alternative world because remember, we're, we've got the information that's being handed to us and that's what we're featuring. And as a result, this is an environment that is profoundly unfair to Hillary Clinton and also in the process shaping attitudes and opinions. The press in part, is aware that it was a problem. Here's a, a reprise article in the New York Times. Every major publication, including the Times, published multiple stories citing the DNC and Podesta emails posted by WikiLeaks becoming a de facto instrument of Russian intelligence. What will they do next time and what should they do is a very difficult question. And if that's being debated in newsrooms, that debate has not spilled over into public. I hope it is and I hope they found solutions. The media's appetite for hacked material and its focus on the gossipy content instead of the Russian source disturbed some of those whose personal emails were being reposted across the web, as it should have. 
Here, the best statement that I've seen of a self-reflective reporter in an opinion piece in the New York Times, the dominant feature of the emails was their ordinariness. They contained no evidence of law-breaking, major hypocrisy, or tawdry scandal. The overhyped coverage of the hacked emails was the media's worst mistake in 2016, one sure to be repeated if not properly understood. What I've argued is that what we have is a situation in which the election climate was fundamentally changed by manipulations of social media and media structures inside our own body politic, taking advantage of all of the kinds of protections that we value, and also taking advantage of a process that was not able to detect what was really going on, and when it was detected in the form of hacking, not carefully reminding us that that's in fact what it was. What's next? It's up to those social media platforms, it's up to those journalists, and it's up to us to be more vigilant about the ways in which we consume politics and news. Thank you, I'd be happy to take comments or questions. <laughs> So, uh, Kathleen will take a few questions before we break for coffee. And uh, way in the back, Andy, or? I have two interrelated questions. I'm Lauren Graham from Cambridge, Massachusetts. First question, how much of the Russian activity you described could be reasonably classified as illegal? And second question, do you recommend changing the laws so that more of it were classified illegal? The hacking is clearly illegal because you're not allowed to steal things from people's computers. <laughs> so there is a law that says you're not supposed to do that. They did it. Um, the social media ad placement by the Russians was illegal because you can't put money into our election system. Whether the rest of it is it is, is open to some debate, but I don't think it is under most reasonable constructions. And we have global media platforms. It would be awful difficult to figure out how you would do anything about it if you wanted to. What the, here is what we are able to do, I think, within the existing legal structure. We are able to increase the likelihood that the platforms voluntarily give us cues about what we're seeing, and they make decisions about what they're going to take and what they're going to post. They have started to do that. Now, if you go on to... Sputnik or RT, the two broadcast outlets, you will see what you see on all of those broadcast platforms that are on YouTube. A disclaimer on the bottom saying this is state-sponsored content. And our PBS now carries that, what's on YouTube, as does BBC. That is an attempt to take something we've known since Aristotle, which is people judge source as they judge message, and increase the likelihood that we factor in that perhaps this is a source we don't trust. And in particular with RT, which changed its name from Russia today, I think it's very important that people know what it is they're seeing and that this, and that this is Russian. So that is a first change. Secondly, you're now, you're now seeing the fact-checking organizations partnering with Facebook to increase the likelihood that when we have caught and fact-checked something, it comes up in the feed against the misinformation. So to the extent that it does that, if we can incentivize people to see it first, we increase the likelihood that that's the memory trace, not the memory trace from the deception. Whether we can incentivize that process is another question. Also, on news content or content that is identifiable, the social media platforms are looking into creating a click that lets you go to ask what is it. And on social media posts, this is very important because Fake news, and the only time I will use the word fake news is when it's an imposter site, which is literally pretending it's something else, will appropriate the look, feel, banner, typeset, tone of actual news, but use it with subversive content. And when you click through now, you see, for example, AP is Associated Press, and then you get a description of what that is. You then get the same kinds of identification with other content. The platforms have also agreed that they're going to try to indicate all of the advertising and all of the advertising sources by individual site. So all of those forms of voluntary activities by the platforms, which are after all at this point still considered private entities, are steps in the right direction. They're obviously trying to forestall legislation in the process of doing all of this. But should there be other, other laws, I will leave that for the lawyers in the room. You know, many of you are more qualified than I to answer that as a question. Up in the balcony? Conrad Harper in New York City. Let me just follow that point one more step. 
do you have a reasonable likelihood of thinking that any or all of those proposed reforms will be effective? <laughs> With some, the, if one's theory of attitude changes when an attitude is deeply anchored and people are, are in an identity protective cognitive space, that is, they're, they're going to, to defend who they are against all comers, the likelihood that you're going to create you know, any kind of protection for them from misinformation is, approaches zero. But inside this world, you have people who are leaning in one direction and another, who do not have much information. These are the people in gym space who come up to higher levels of knowledge when you bring them into a deliberative poll. They can be protected from this. And so, Yes, at least for that group, and that group I think is actually larger than most people think it is. I don't think most people want to be deceived. I think, however, many of the people who were exposed to this content were, if they were going to vote, going to vote for Donald Trump. The question was, were they going to vote in an environment in which they had conflictive signals? Why were the evangelicals less likely to support Donald Trump in August? It's not hard to guess. Thrice married candidate, you can go on and on. Why were the veterans less likely to support? He'd attacked John McCain's heroism. He'd attacked the Gold Star family. He had had multiple draft deferments for a transient bone spur. So in that environment, essentially, could you increase the likelihood that because they were conflicted, they're not already locked down in one place, they would be receptive to information that says, wait a minute, you know, that's information you may not want to trust. Probably, we would suggest that at least from reasonable attitude theory. Ms. Averson? Hi. Hi again. Um, I'm okay. not pandering. I hope you're going to make all this presentation a book, because it, it, it deserves one. <laughs> um, she, did, she, didn't bring, she didn't bring her page proofs. That's, you know, <laughs> unlike Jim. You know. I, 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 a couple quick comments and a question. The comments are about um, the news media being manipulated and the attitude towards leaks in general. I mean, there's a, see, an interesting sea change between the Sony Corporation email leaks, which the New York Times, for example, um, had an edict for their reporters saying they would not let them use the leaked emails on the internet for reporting purposes because they were stolen. Uh, from that moment, to obviously WikiLeaks and Podesta at all emails, a big change. Interesting to figure out why, number one. Number two is uh, the, the decline, uh, the, the actual success of the Russian manipulation in terms of the outcome of the vote. And I'd love you to spend a few minutes expanding on that, for instance, black vote um, levels in key states like Wisconsin and Michigan are like way, way down, like 12%, 10%. You'd expect some kind of decline from Obama, but not like that. So could, could you address that, please? Now, it took 78,000 votes to swing the election in, the, in three of the three states that were close. Um, and the question then is states that were less close, such as Florida, where we know there was a great deal of Russian activity, it's possible there was a large enough effect there as well. What we don't know in answering the question, did they affect vote, was to what extent was this micro-targeted in those states in ways that could have produced those shifts in those states. The social media platforms actually do know who is targeted. And Congress has that information. Those of you who are journalists, why are you not insisting that that data be released, those data be released? They also haven't released the bulk of the information that they have from the platforms of the actual content, which would also help us answer the question in combination with Mike Rattardi more exactly what was the effect. To your question of what was the effect, the historical, black, the historical record on the black vote suggests that it dropped substantially below where we would have expected even in regards to the Obama up, uptick. So the, it looks as if there was a lower point than there would have been historically otherwise, which suggests that there was some, some effective demobilization. I don't want to call it suppression because suppression has other kinds of meanings in terms of ballot access, et cetera. Uh, we also know that if you take as baseline the Stein vote 
for the previous election, and it's convenient because she's their party's nominee for both elections. And you treat that as her base vote for those two elections, and you take the difference between that base vote and the vote that she got in this election in two out of three of the three states that ultimately decided the election. That change alone, if that vote went to Hillary Clinton, would have decided the election in Hillary Clinton's favor in those two states. So we know in those two cases. We also know that as of August, if you take the level of support with the veterans community, the Catholic community that is conservative, conservative Catholic community, and, and the veterans and evangelical community, and you just you, you mark it through and project its vote onto election day, you, you have a wipeout election for Hillary Clinton. So that mobilization function is the other piece that is a really critical part of this election. And if you say, what do you need to do with those people? They are genuinely conflicted. That's why they're below their historic averages. If veterans, conservative Catholics, and evangelicals vote, they are highly likely to vote Republican. The question is, how do you get them to actually cast that ballot in an environment in which there are real reasons to dislike John McCain? And that's why I started by saying you increase the salience of everything that's anti-Clinton, and in effect, you silence in their cognitive state all of those things they already feel about Donald Trump. You just make them a whole lot less salient, and that's the theory of mobilization. I think you can make a plausible case from the existing evidence that the hacking alone, the effects of the hacking alone, were sufficient to swing the election. Well, I'd like to thank Kathleen for ending the morning session on such a cheerful note. <laughs>